Right, I'm going to read from the Gospel of Mark, and it's the first chapter. And John has a bit of struggle with his glasses sometimes, so um, I volunteered. And it's headed, John the Baptist prepares the way. The beginning of the Gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send a messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one crying in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I will baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. Should I tell you where we went our first date? A graveyard. It was cheaper. Anyway, it's nice to see you this morning. Bless your heart. I'm sure you're wondering what on earth that scripture reading has got to do with Christmas. And so was I. <clears throat> but nevertheless, I'll try to figure it out as we go through this morning. <clears throat> anyway, the Lord be kind to you and be very good to you. This your word and these your people. Bless for Jesus' sake. Amen. My question is, how on earth did we lose Christmas? That's the question. How on earth did we lose Christmas? Well, you're asking the question because the extravaganza has already started. Lights are twinkling. Not so many now as there used to be, but lights are twinkling. Noise is being heard everywhere, especially in tills. People are grasping at every last straw they can get to make it pay more. Have you seen the adverts on television? Have you seen one advert that refers to Christmas? I haven't. And I've tried to follow as many as I can. But I haven't seen a child. I haven't heard of the miracle of the Lord coming. I've heard a lot about different types of beer and whiskeys and gin and, and a thousand other things and clothes by the cartload. But I've never heard about Jesus being born on Christmas Day. It's amazing, isn't it, when you think of it? That we can come to the place where even the advertising on television <clears throat> has missed out what Christmas is all about. How did we lose Christmas? But I asked myself the same question 
in reading this chapter in, in Mark, did Mark lose Christmas? Because Mark and John, uh, Mark and Luke, do not speak about Christmas at all. Luke and John speak about Christmas, but not Mark and Luke. And I was thinking to myself, <clears throat> did they lose Christmas as well? Did something happen in their lives that they started without reminding us again that Christ the Lord was born for us? Did the lights dazzle them? Did the very fact that everything around them was gay and merry and, and bright? And that's what we've got. That's why twinkling lights came to me. They were just dead lights at one time, and then they bought twinkling lights because it made it more like stars. It made you more happy, it made you bright, it made you more wonderful. We've got lights in our tree that does all sorts. It's not even a tree, it's a branch, but never mind. It looks good, and all these lights are blah, 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 and all sorts of things. They go mad, and they mesmerize you, and you stop thinking that there is something about this that I don't understand. Perhaps it is we've relegated Christmas to a holiday season. Ah, that could be it. We don't say uh, Merry Christmas, we say Happy Holiday. We can't mention Christ at Christmas because we may offend someone of a different faith. And we'll be arrested if we offend someone. Perhaps it's that. We're afraid to offend someone with the message that the Lord has come. Or are we just justifying ourselves? Well, it's years ago, it's a long time ago, it's, it's come and gone. We want to come quickly and go quickly. The quicker it comes, the quicker it goes. And perhaps we'll find more peace after that. Well, I'm going to give you two thoughts here. One is that Christmas is essentially the birth of a child. Nothing more and nothing less. The birth of a child. We've got to remember that unto us this day is born a child, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. We've got to recognize that the birth of Christ is absolutely essential to our Christian faith. In fact, there is no going forward unless we remember the Christ of God. You need a beginning, and it has to be there. But the problem with us is we have kept it there. The church has been so busy reminding itself of how in a bed of straw a child was born that we've forgotten to resurrect them. So Christmas becomes the all-absorbing thing of the church, all the pomp and, and ceremony that we can muster and bring about in order to bring people into the church. We call it Christmas. But you can't keep a child in straw forever. When I was pastor over in Lisbon years ago, <clears throat> a lady in my congregation had a, a son, well, she had two sons, and one of them, when the younger one was a real terrible, he put a suit on him and put him in the garden, and it was up to here in mud, muck. He just loved digging in muck. You couldn't keep him clean. One day she was going somewhere and she had him all dolled up. Rodney, poor Rodney, got his we call him tie on, his wee jacket on. But she let him out in the garden for five minutes while she got ready. And she looked out the window to call him in. And there was Rodney sitting in it and he was up to here in it. You could see him, nothing but dirt and muck. She shouted at him, screamed at him, what have you done? And she was... And this lady across the fence who had just become her new neighbor <coughs> leaned across and said to her, don't shout at him. Don't chastise him like that. She said, I wish my son was in there in the mud with him. 
And she looked across the fence to see this new neighbour. And there in a little wheelchair was a child. <clears throat> Same age as Rodney. But he couldn't walk. He couldn't run. He couldn't sit up. He was kept like a child because of sickness. We can't keep Christ in a manger. He was born in a manger. We should praise God for it. The miracle of that is essential to us, that he is born. Can you catch the imagination of people around him in that day when he was born? You take it. The innkeeper, for instance, was too busy with his work to even acknowledge that she was pregnant or anything, but gave her a stable. <clears throat> Get her out of the way. I've got too much to do. It's amazing, isn't it? Can you think of Herod sitting in his palace knowing that there's going to be a child born? Somehow he knows. The prophets are telling him, the people are seers around him. But he's too afraid of a child to go and see for himself. Or you take the leaders of Jerusalem. They knew that something was happening, but they were too lazy to walk five miles to Bethlehem. To see this wonder of wonders. Compare that to the shepherds. The shepherds are in the field and it's really dark and dismal. It's been a hard day. It always is a hard day. And suddenly a great light appears and a host of angels. Man, I would have been buried there and then. But they're looking at it. And you hear voices from heaven saying, Christ the Lord, wake up, wake up. For unto you this day is born in the city of David a child. And they said to them, we must go and see this thing. <laughs> no, they didn't have to say that. They could have said, oh, we've had a hard night. We'll wait till tomorrow morning and then we'll see it then. He'll still be there. <laughs> or they could have said, what has that got to do with us? There are thousands of children being born tonight. Thousands of them all over the country. What's another one? Or they could have even done what good church people do, call a committee to discuss it. We could have a debating society to see what is and what isn't. But no, they get up and went. And they saw the child. Take this, the wise men. The wise men in the east, they see a star, a star. Now this guy was full of stars. We don't see too many stars now because of all the lights around us. When we lived in Canada, we could see stars everywhere, hundreds, thousands, millions of them in the sky. But we don't see them here too much because we too much light around us to see them. But they saw this one star. I don't know what kind of star it was. I don't even know how it radiated to them, but it brought them. And these three men, walked towards the star. They decided they would follow it. So they collected gifts that they had because they knew something was there and they were going to collect gifts. So they brought gifts. They go across a desert, and they don't even know where they're going. They don't know what they're going to find. They don't know how long it will take. They don't know all that they'll need, but they went. And they saw the child, and they worshipped. Is that not a, a reminder to the people of God, people like myself and you, who are witnessing for Christ? saying that Jesus Christ is my saviour? Should we not be more enthusiastic and willing to go that mile, 10 mile, 100 mile, if necessary, to achieve what God wants us to do? 
But no. We look for excuses that we can't do it because our, the wild wind or the, that we don't feel so good or our feet are bad or something else has happened to us or it's more difficult or, well, I'll just watch it on the television. It doesn't seem to matter anymore. But it did to those men and they saw and they worshipped. And it's all to see for yourself. Come and see, Andrew said to his brother. Come and see. Come and see a man. The man. That's what we're looking for. Come and see him. We need to come and see him for ourselves. We need to be a visitor right there where the child was born. We need to see Christ as a child for ourselves. We need to see and, and capture the wonder of it and, and, and the, the thing that comes to it, the mystery. Is that not what Christmas is all about? Where is it? We've lost it. Why on earth did we lose Christmas? How? I went to a little garden centre at Christmas time called Barton Grange. <clears throat> it was quite a big one actually. And they had a big section of the, the, the garden centre sort of covered over to make it the mystery of Christmas. And every year, they still do it even today, you, you go into Barton Grange, it's over in Manchester, and you, you follow the, the signs for where you're going. And the first thing you see, of course, is the the scene. And it's life-sized uh, statues and things have got in it. But the whole mystery of it, the, the wise men are there, the, 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 the shepherds are there, the animals are there, and one or two live ones do. And, and they're all there. And, and the baby in the manger is right there. The lights are on it, leaning down. And songs are being sung all the time, joy to the world, the Lord has come. It's quite exciting. I got more excited than the kids. <clears throat> Our kid was a bit older, but I made him go with me because we could go in together. Because uh, I might well tell you I'm still the same today. Um, I, she said, one of these days I'll grow up. <clears throat> but I'm taking my time. <clears throat> but I was looking at, at the scene again and marvelling at the, the work of the, the craftsmen as much as anything. And then I heard this wee voice starting to cry. A wee girl standing beside me and her mum and dad. And she was crying away and screaming. It's not there! It's not there! Oh, what is it not there? And I thought, what's not there? And I said, oh, the wise men are there. Look, look, the wise men, the shepherds are there. And, and there's baby Jesus in, in the cradle. See, see, they're there. Mum and dad are there. They're all there. It's not there! And she was going to kick the, the wires. And I said to her, what is not there? And she says she's looking for the rabbit. There was a wee pet rabbit that ran up and down, but it was underneath the statues or in the cradle, so I don't know where it was. But she associated Christmas with a rabbit. A rabbit. We girl in school was drawing a picture because of it. they were teaching her about Christmas. <clears throat> And uh, she, she, she drew Mary and Joseph and we were in, in, in a manger. And then at, at the end of the table, she drew a wee fat man with a great big smile on his face. And the teacher couldn't understand that. She said, who, who is that? She says, oh, that's round John Virgin. What we're saying is, we don't even represent it properly. We don't know what our children are hearing. And it doesn't seem to make any difference to their lives. It doesn't seem to bring wonder to their hearts that this Christmas is here. All they want to know is, are they going to get a PlayStation or, or they're going to get a, a, a computer or, or something of electronic wonder? That's what they're looking for. They're not interested in Christmas. And what are the elderly looking for? Well, a nice meal and peace and quiet. What has Christmas become to us? 
I tell you this, you take Christ out of Christmas and all you've got is m &S. That's all. Well, how do we lose Christmas? How is it possible for us to remove Christmas? But here's the wonder of Christmas. Is that all history tells us that God was looking after his people, chosen people. He guided them, protected them, fed them, watered them, made sure they could even go through the harshest of climates to get to the land that he promised them. This was God. God going before them as fire and as a cloud behind them. He was a leader, a guider all the way through. But always a mystery. No one had seen God at any time. Moses didn't see him when he was given, uh, they were, although he was up there in the mountain with him. Abraham never saw him, but he had a voice. Who saw him? No one. But when Christ was born, grace was given a face. God revealed himself in Christ. If you have seen me, you have seen my father, he said. Grace has suddenly got a face. They knew grace all their life because it had to be there because they were so evil and turning aside from God regularly. It was only grace could bring them through. But now grace is a face, a child is born. But the second thing is this. Essentially, Christmas is a, a call for repentance. That's what it is. It's a call for repentance. For God so loved the world, we know it, that God gave his own, one and only Son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. It's a call to repentance. It's not a call just to sing songs. It's not a call to eat more food. It's a call to repent. God made the promise that in the Old Testament that he would send someone. In the New Testament, he suddenly keeps his promise. He keeps his word. And they're amazed at this. Even when he was a child, he stood in a, a temple and he, 12 years old, and he confused the, the teachers. He confused them because he knew so much. He was a child. The call to repentance comes because Christ came. And that's why I believe Mark and John, Mark and, and Luke, they recognize, they recognize that Matthew and John have spoken of the birth, clear pictures of the birth, given a wonderful education in the birth. But the child has to grow and become a man. And this is where we're confused today. We keep Christmas. Families who have never been in church for one more one year have suddenly gone to church again because it's Christmas. The church is getting excited. Why? Because it's Christmas. But the call is for repentance. It was for that purpose that Christ came, and we've got to be aware of it. When Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate, and he was accused by the Jews, and they, Pilate said, why, in the 8th chapter of John, why, why, do you, why do you bring this man to me? And they said, well, he's a criminal, but why are you brought him to me? Because we can't sentence him to death. Now, there's a reason they wanted rid of him. They didn't want to hide him. They didn't want to put him in prison. They wanted to end him. And Jesus said, what have you done? 
to cause this. Are you a king? And Jesus said, you answer, you ask the right question. For this purpose came I into the world. For this reason. To teach the truth. And every one who hears the truth is my disciple. Isn't that some? It's there. 820, 30, I think it is. But you, you find it. The whole thing is that the call that Jesus came, the reason, the purpose he came, was that he might reach out and touch. You see, it's always been God looking for us. God searching for us. It's always been God looking for us, but no response from man because we walk in darkness. We have educated ourselves and designed ourselves in such a way that we have one purpose in life, and that's to get what we can and keep it. And yet God's purpose was to give what he had and share him. Here is the purpose of Christ. That he might bring joy to the world. <laughs> the great proclamation is there. Joy to the world. Glory to God. Get excited. Glory. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. He came to bring us peace. We wrote the candle this morning. My peace I'll give to you. I'll give it to you. He came to bring us life. Life. For we were dead in trespasses. In fact, Peter, in the first chapter, when he's describing himself and talks about it, he said, we who were a no people, no people, non-existent. We weren't in the promise of Jerusalem. We weren't in the promise of the, the, the people of God. We were no people. But then Jesus came. And when Jesus came as a child, he lived as a man. And the man, Christ Jesus, was challenged by everyone around him and everything around him. How are you representing God? But they cast him that time and time again in various fashions. They wanted to know. John wanted to know, the Baptist. He wanted to know if he was after he baptized him, after he saw the heavens open, after he saw the Spirit descending. After all that, John wrote this question. Are you the one? Go and ask him. Because he was in prison about to be beheaded. And he wanted to know, is Christ the real answer? Is Jesus the one? And he says, go and tell John. The sick have been healed. The deaf can hear. The lame can rise. And the dead will live. Ha <laughs> ha! Glory to God! He is the real thing. He is Christmas incarnate. He is Christmas grown. He is Christmas as a man who is about to extend all his love that God say, gave to us in Calvary. When he asked them how much he loved them, he stretched out his hands and were nailed to a cross. That's how much. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the man because the man has to follow the child. And if there's no man, then there is no child. If there is no child, there is no man. So where do we go from here? Do we keep him in the cradle or are we to bring him alive today, walking with us and talking with us and living with us? God with us is a good thing, but God in us is a better. We need Christ in us, the hope of glory. We need to call, feel that God is speaking to us. The problem is, Christmas, if you're not a good boy, you'll not get anything. That's what I was told anyway, because I never got anything, because I was never, I was never good. But good, good. And it nice to be good. And, and, and then we, we, we're sorry for things we've done 
done bad. So as children were, well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I won't do it again until tomorrow. You know. And a fellow went to the priest one day, the farmer, and he said to the priest, Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. And he said, what have you done, my son? Well, he said, <clears throat> I was up at the neighboring farmer and I stole half his stack away. And uh, I'm sorry I did it. Well, he says, you, you, you'll have to repay this with seven Hail Marys and, and you've got to be very careful and, and, and seek forgiveness. He says, Father, could you make it 14? Because I'm going back today to steal the other half. That's like children. We're always sorry. I can't tell you this. Listen carefully. Being sorry, being sorrow, or sorry for your sin, does not save you. Do you understand that? Being sorry does not save you. Repentance for your sin and confession of Christ, discovering the man who was born in the manger, discovering the one who died on the cross and rose again according to the scriptures, the one who promised it was there, the message is this, Christ has not come to peddle death and gloom. Have we got that? No, we've got the joyful part of the child. It's there. Everyone's rejoicing because the child is there. And we, we make children happy. We sing choirs and we get going with little songs and make that step jingles. But the man, the man, We need to see that we need the man Christ. Oh, rejoice at Christmas and keep the festival day because it is Christ was born on Christmas Day. But the purpose of his coming is to bring hope to the hopeless, joy to the despairing, life to the dead, peace to the troubled. He came with all these things to us and gave them to us. This is what Christ did. This is what the child fulfilled his promise did. I am always, he said, obedient to my father. Isn't that strange? I am always obedient to my father. And God sent him. And we thank God. Jesus came. And we thank Jesus for coming. The Holy Spirit tells us and convicts of sin and judgment and righteousness. And we thank him. For the call of Christmas is for redemption. I remind you this. That the Christian message is undaunted by the rages of, of men and hell. It is available by the grace of God. And nothing that the devil can throw at this can alter Christ's message. Nothing. Come unto me, and I will give you. And I will give you. There's no question about that. He gives and gives and gives again because it is God's prerogative to give. But being sorry for all this is not enough. We need to know him. We need to accept him. We need to experience him. We need to know that he's there and Christ is in us. Dr. James Simpson he, he's a man that, uh, that brought chloroform to the world. And uh, he was a, a good Christian man. And Dr. Uh, Professor Simpson was 
asked the question, is this the greatest discovery at that time? Because no pain when they gave you chloroform. <laughs> they would saw off your leg and there was nothing in it. You just had to take it. But now he could bring painless surgery to you. Great, great discovery. And he asked Dr. Professor Simpson, is that the greatest discovery ever made? And no, says Dr. Simpson. The greatest discovery that any man can ever make is, is that Jesus Christ is his Savior. And now that's from the professor of Potter. The greatest discovery that any man, any man can ever make is the discovery that Jesus Christ is his Savior. Do you know that? I mean, is Christ still the child, the wonder of Christmas? Is that what we're worshipping, the baby in a manger? Or have we seen the Christ extended arms on the cross that's saying, I love you, I love you, and I give myself for you. Do you see the empty tomb <laughs> when he rose again? And he rose again. Can you see him ascending into heaven and saying, one day I'll come back again? He will come back. Some golden day break, Jesus will come. But are we prepared for his coming? Are we in the place where we're worshiping Christ, the Lord? Christ the Lord. Not just Christ to be, but Christ the Lord. The man who walked into the water and was baptized with John. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for all he's done for us and all he means to us. Please help us, we pray, that we might know the peace of God in our hearts, that the wonder of Christmas may become the wonder of it all. Touch our lives, we pray, and help us, Lord, to find out the truth of forgiveness, not just being sorry, but being repentant and finding that Christ is the answer to my every need. Christ is the answer. He is my friend indeed. Sorrows and sighs may soon disappear. Nothing can harm me while Jesus is near. Christ is the answer to your life and to mine. Amen.